to welcome our worldwide radio audience to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We're an inner city congregation in Dallas, Texas, of the poor, the meek, and the downtrodden. We've got our jail chaplain with us today. Brother Eddie, tell us about the jail work. Well, I just want to let you know that everything's going well, as, as expected, because it's work, God's work. You know, we got uh, more ministers than we need, so God's filling all the holes. You know, we, there are units that we go into that we're not allowed to baptize. But some of those men, I'm sure as soon as they uh, get out of, out of their locked up situation, they're going to be coming to one of our churches. We now give them a list of all the churches in the area where they can go and get baptized. But we see it on their faces that we had the opportunity to baptize them, we could do it that day. Uh, last Sunday, so we baptized 13, but that Friday night, the uh, chaplain had baptized 27. So I know that's a continuation of our preaching and going on. So y'all just keep us in prayer and continue to uh, let us do what God let us to do. Amen, Eddie. I see that you've baptized 402 this year That's and, and 18,000 since 1998. Y'all let the church say amen. amen. Thank the Lord. Boy, what a work. It's a great, great work. And all things are possible to him who believes. Mountain moving faith. Ain't nothing like it. We're going to start where we left off last week in Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 20, a great and powerful verse in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3, open your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Paul has now told us what our great rights and privileges are as members of the Church of Christ and God's own kingdom. Now, <clears throat> Paul says, now to him who's able, now to him who's able to do, now to him who's able to do exceedingly. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or all that we think. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or all that we think, according to the power that worketh within us. us. Amazing. According to the mighty power, krakos in the Greek, that worketh energios in the Greek, that worketh within us. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or all that we think according to the power that worketh within us, the Holy Spirit that liveth within us. In 2010, we had one little radio broadcast. One little old radio broadcast. In December of this past year, we went from 10 international radio broadcasts to 20 international radio broadcasts. There is a great world out there that God wants conquered. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In 1 John 5, 14, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Lord, let me win the lottery. Lord, give me a brand new Cadillac. Lord, let me build a new uh, uh, skating rink on the side of the church here. 
If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now what have we asked? We asked, Lord, will you please double our radio broadcast? We ask in prayer, standing here on a Sunday morning. And we went from 10 to 20 international radio broadcasts every Sunday morning. Look at the world. In North America, there's a half a billion people. South America, half a billion people. Africa, a billion people. Europe through Russia, a billion people. In Asia, 4.5 billion people. There is 1.2 billion people in India and 1.4 billion people in China. There are more people in China learning English than there are in the United States that speak English. There are over 7 billion people in the world today. And when Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, there was only 300 million. We have opportunities today like we've never had before in history. Our radio broadcasts go out to all of North Texas and part of Oklahoma from Dallas. Goes out to Abilene. Shame on you out there, Randy, and the change movement. Oklahoma City, it covers all of Oklahoma. Nashville covers, uh, it's a 50,000 watt blaster. It covers all of uh, Tennessee, Alabama, parts of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and Kentucky. Our first international radio broadcast covers about 5 billion people. It covers all of North and South America. Africa, it's got a billion people. Europe, India. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Broadcast uh, 2 goes over the North Pole and covers all of Russia, all of India, all of China, and all of the Pacific. It's Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia. Broadcast 3 covers Africa, Europe, and India, and Russia. Broadcast 4 gets North America. Broadcast 5 gets South America. Broadcast 6 goes over the North Pole again and covers about three billion people in that broadcast area, getting China, Russia, and India. Broadcast seven covers, uh, again, that same area, Russia, um, India, China, and all the Pacific. Broadcast um, eight, nine, and 10 covers uh, all of Africa. It's called the Radio Africa Network. There's 13, there's, there is, uh, 21 English-speaking countries in Africa that has a 78% of the people can't read. Their only chance is to hear the spoken word of God. We get letters from Africa and emails just all the time uh, asking us for, for help, for Bibles, for Bible study material, for for college-level courses. And we send college-level courses out to every preacher that asks us for help. And broadcast 11, again, just repeats everything that we did through broadcast uh, one through 10. Broadcast 11 covers about three billion people, Africa, India, all of Europe. Broadcast uh, 12 covers North America, 13 South America, 14 gets all of China, India, Russia, and the Pacific. Uh, 15, 16, and 17 gets all of Africa again. One is in the morning, one is in the afternoon on all these broadcasts. Broadcast 18 covers all the Pacific again. 19 covers most of the world except just part of China and the Pacific. About 5 billion people in that radio broadcast area. Broadcast 20 covers most of the world. 120 countries has picked up in. The day that we doubled our radio broadcast, that morning at six o'clock in the morning, I called an ambulance for my wife and she went in the hospital and she's been in the hospital for nine months. That morning, I showed up here at 11 o'clock to preach and they told me you got no power. The, my, the rats have eat your microphone wires and your speaker wires and the rats run amok downstairs and, and destroyed about $2,000 worth of food supplies. Now what power on earth could 
make my wife sick and put her in the hospital and, and paralyze her for the last nine months. One of her nurses is here today. I thank you, Barbara, from the bottom of my heart for you ministering to her and helping save her at uh, doctor's hospital. They sent her over there in hospice. This woman here cleaned her and took care of her and helped save her. And uh, I thank you so very much. Ginger's loved around this church. She was my bouncer on the back door out here for years. And she did a good job at it too. Now Barbara takes care of her in the nursing home. And so what power on earth controls rats and sickness? Can't be nothing but slew food. And so now we have 21. We've added one more international broadcast. Now what does that verse say? Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Do you think that he can double it again? Let's ask him. Almighty God, King of the universe, we believe that you want the gospel to go to all the earth. So we pray that you send us the ability to take this 27 broadcast and make it 54. Amen. Only you can do that. We promise, Father, that we'll continue to serve you just exactly as we've been serving you. And we'll be thankful and we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There, uh, there really is such a thing as mountain moving faith. In Ephesians 3.21, summing up the verse and prior to it, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that now worketh within us, Ephesians 3.21, now to him to be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, forever and ever is what that means. It's really not cosmos without all end because there will really literally will be an end. Christ will come again and there will be an end. Amen. So be it is what amen means in the Greek or Hebrew. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. There's a thousand sermons on there. There's a library. There's all kinds of DVDs. You can watch the service here. You can see the same thing that the audience sees on the screen. You can, uh, uh, there's all kinds of written lessons. You can use them for your Sunday school classes and all kinds of links and resources. Now we're going to continue to study about the church. What is the church? The church is the kingdom of God. It's the church of Christ. It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. It's you. It's the people of Christ. Church comes from a Greek word, ek, meaning out, klesia, ecclesiastica, meaning called, the out called. We're called out of the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of his dear son, we're called out of darkness into light. We're called out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God. You are the called out. You're very, very special people. There's nobody like you on earth. Nobody else can ask and receive from God. If the Savior is so powerful that His blood is able to save us from all our past sins, His death is able to save us from that, how much more powerful is a living Savior who is now seated at God's own right hand that's tugging on God's robe and says, Hey, did you hear what Brother Kelly asked for? He didn't ask for a new car. He didn't ask for a skating ring. He asked for more gospel preaching. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk, that you live, that you practice in your everyday life worthy of the vocation wherein you were called. Paul was a prisoner because he was a servant. These are the practical duties which now are urged upon all brethren. They come because of our glorious privileges that we have in Christ Jesus. They had been called to a glorious calling, the people at Ephesus, and uh, in chapter 3. Christians have been called with the highest calling that man has ever been honored with. We are very, very special privileged people. 
And so how do we walk in the worthy of the Lord? Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. We're to walk and live in all humility and gentleness of the Spirit. These are the characteristics of walking worthy. To be easily offended, to take umbrage or offense from our brothers, and to seek to get even by paying a brother back for any injury is opposite to these qualities. If the heart is filled with love, the other qualities are shown forth. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1.13, I'd encourage you to go read that and, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Go read that chapter. It's about love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I've become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You drop down to verse 3, and though I give my body to be burned and all my goods to feed the poor and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. We have to do these things out of love, out of devotion to those that are less fortunate than us. That's the reason that we feed the poor. That's the reason that we put out 3,000 meals a week here. That's the reason that we do without pay and do without salaries around here. We're going to get paid up in heaven. Didn't Jesus say, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth or rust doesn't uh, destroy? Didn't he say that? I think I remember reading that somewhere. And so I wonder why more people don't practice that. There's nothing wrong with pay. There's nothing wrong with salaries. But I really am concerned about preachers becoming professionals to a point that uh, they got to have 100000 a year and... Uh, a hundred thousand, half of a hundred thousand a year, half of a hundred thousand a year, well, more, we could have a hundred hours on the radio. It's unbelievable how cheap you can buy this radio time if you're willing to buy great blocks of radio time like we do. It's unbelievable how cheap it is. If those of you out there, if there's a rancher out there, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, if there's a rancher out there that would like to help broadcast the gospel to the whole wide world, you can do that for as little as $100 a week. You can broadcast the gospel to the entire earth. That would be two broadcasts, one to North and South America, Europe, Africa, and uh, uh, half of Russia and India and the other over the North Pole to China, India. In fact, you'd cover more than, than the whole earth. You'd cover the earth about one and a half times. Ephesians 4, 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. Regarding unity, Jesus prayed that all of his children would be one. In John 17, verse 20, Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them that shall believe on me through their word. He's talking about the apostles. He said, I don't pray just for these, the apostles alone, but for those that will believe on me because of their word. You and I believe right now today because the apostles wrote down Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter of the Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so on, forth and so on. They wrote down the New Testament. If they didn't write it down, you wouldn't know anything about it. Now, they all spoke the same thing. It didn't matter who you were taught by. You were taught the same thing, Paul tells us. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them that shall believe on me through their word, that's you and I, that they all may be 300 different denominations. Is that what that says? It says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou sent me. Why doesn't the world believe? Where did the vast amount of unbelief come from in the world? Well, it came from all these different denominations. If a person goes down 
the front, walks the aisle at the invitation song in the Catholic church and says, what must I do to be saved? And he walks the aisle in a Presbyterian church and says, what must I do to be saved? And he walks the aisle in a Pentecostal church and says, what must I do to be saved? And he walks the aisle in a Baptist church and he says, what must I do to be saved? You're going to get a different answer from every one of them. God is not the author of confusion. Where did all this confusion come from? That's why people don't believe. Some people tell you, well, it doesn't matter, said, said you just need to believe. And other people will tell you, oh, you're saved by faith alone. And other people will tell you, oh, you've got to come down here to mourner's bench and you've got to pray your way through. And then others will tell you, well, you've got to show up dressed like a chicken and, and, uh, and you're good to go. They got every kind of doctrine in the world. Jesus said, in vain do they worship me, teaching for their doctrine the tradition of men. Paul also beseeches that we, they be no divisions in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you therefore, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same Judgment. You go on and read that because they started uh, uh, making denominations there. Forbearance and long suffering are essential to unity and peace. They must be unity of those that have the same spirit. Look at Ephesians 4 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as your call in hope of your calling. The unity commanded has a basis. And seven unities which are existed in the church and should exist through all the ages. There was one body, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, not a Gentile body and a Jewish body. Modern denominations were unknown. In Romans 12, 5, it says, So that we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of one of another. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for as the body is one, has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether we're bonds or free, in other words, whether we're slaves or free men back then. And Paul didn't okay slavery by saying that because he lists men stealing as a sin. In Galatians chapter 5, whether we be bond or free, whether we've all been made to drink of one spirit. In Ephesians 2.16 says that he might reconcile both, speaking of Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. In Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. First place. First place. Jesus gets first place in everything. In fact, everything that is not Christian is antichrist. Antichrist means instead of Christ, in place of Christ, and is substituted for Christ. So if you call yourself by some other name other than a Bible name, the name that God's own mouth has designed, Christian, if you call yourself by any other name, it is Antichrist. It's instead of Christ and in place of Christ. A lot of people in the world are taught wrong. We're trying to help teach them right. These verses state plainly that there's one body, the church. What is it about the word one that you don't understand? I don't understand how people could misunderstand the word one. It means plainly that there's just one church. We learned in Ephesians that word body now. I want you to notice that that word body means church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, body means church. 
That's the definition of this word body. In Ephesians, the same book, Ephesians 1, 22, and has put all things under his feet, under Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. So you see, the word body means church. You got that? Okay, now look at Ephesians 4, 4 again. There is one body. What is it you don't understand about body? One body. <clears throat> Notice the word the church. He has put all things under his feet, to give him to be the head over all things to the church, Ephesians 1, 22, to the church. You see that word the the definite article in the Greek language means the one and only. In the beginning, Christ said, upon this rock will I build my church. There was one church. It would be like the guy who made the first airplane. Orville and Wilbur Wright. And I show up there out at Kitty Hawk. And I see that airplane, and I see them fly for the first time. They go maybe 100 yards in there and then land again. And I go up there, and I say, what is that? And they say, it's an airplane. And I tell them, what kind of airplane? Yeah. Well, it ain't a kind of airplane. It is the airplane. There's no other airplane. There's no other airplane on earth but that one airplane. Now, since then, men have made manufacturing companies, and they make kinds of airplanes. They make Cessnas, and they make Boeing, and they make all these different kinds of airplanes. But in the beginning, it wasn't so. There was just one airplane. It was the same way with the church. Men throughout history have always thought that they could improve on God's plan. They come up with ideas. They say, I could give you one right now today. <clears throat> we just took the Lord's Supper, didn't we? Yeah. And you know something? Jesus loves little children, doesn't he? And we left the little children out of that. They didn't get a chance to take anything with the Lord's Supper. Now, what would be wrong with us getting another pan and Bernie Woods has got some bubble gum and let's put the bubble gum in the other pan. And let's pass the bubble gum when we pass the bread and the fruit of the vine. And let the children have some bubble gum. What would be wrong with that? The Bible doesn't tell us not to do it, does it? It is a stupid argument. The Bible doesn't tell us what not to do. It tells us what to do. It tells us what to do. If it told us everything not to do, the Bible, would, you couldn't even fit it in this building. The Bible doesn't tell me not to baptize in whiskey. It doesn't make sense. The argument doesn't make sense. What is the authority that you have for everything you do in worship and in practice and in Scripture? We in the churches of Christ believe that we, we are returned to the Bible people. We believe in not adding to the Word and not taking away from the Word. We believe in practicing New Testament Christianity as it was in the beginning, when it was the church, when it was the one and only church, when there was no other church, and when everybody were Christians and all members of the same body. Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as you're called, one hope you're called. Where the disagreement begins, Baptist preachers believe that there's one church. Catholic priests believe that there's one church. Pentecostal preachers believe that there's one church. They just believe that their church is the church. And they can't any of them point to Romans 16.16, 16, where it says, salute one another, the holy kiss, 
the churches of Christ salute you. The different congregations of the church of Christ salute you. Christ died for the church. It is his body. It is was purchased by his own blood. If you have been bought, you're a slave. Have you been purchased by the blood of Christ? I have. I hope you have. Then you belong to him. You better wear his name. What if my wife told me, hey, listen, you've got this friend, Ty Simmons, and I don't like the name Ginger Lawson. I'm going to be called Ginger Simmons. What do you think I'd tell her? I tell her you married the wrong dude, man. If you want to be called, you want to be called Simmons, you should have married that dude. But you're gonna be my wife. You're gonna wear my name, and we need to wear the name of Christ. Ephesians four five. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. In Colossians one eighteen, He's the head of the body of the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have preeminence. 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? One faith is often called the faith, meaning the gospel or pure New Testament Christianity. That is the word that's used there. There is one Greek, in the Greek it says one, Greek, tis pistios, one, the faith. Entire New Testament Christianity is the faith. It's not talking about your faith. It's talking about the New Testament Christianity. All of the doctrines and teachings of New Testament Christianity make up the faith. One Lord Jesus Christ who is head of the church. 1 Corinthians 1.13 is Christ divided. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Christ, uh, Paul? <clears throat> one faith, meaning entire New Testament Christianity, one baptism, for all have been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ upon the profession of the faith. It is utterly inconsistent with the apostles' argument that they be three ways to administer baptism such as sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which is a trans-anglicized word. And in 1611, when the translators of the King James translation of the Bible were translating the Bible, King James insisted because of the Church of England that they keep the ecclesiastical or Catholic word such as bishop and things like that. So they translated episcopos, bishop, as an example. And instead of elder, some places they translated elder just to get it in there. Well, one of the, trans, uh, one of the problems that they had was how to translate baptizo. How do you translate baptism? So if you lie, and you translate it sprinkling or pour, you'd make the Catholics uh, happy, but you'd make the, uh, the, the Protestants, uh, the mainline conservative Protestant Reformation, you'd make them mad. But if you translate it dip or immerse in water, then you'd make the Catholics mad and some of the Protestants, like the Presbyterians, who sprinkle. So what they decided to do was make up a word. They said it's in veneral to us, and so they decided, well, we'll just make up a word, and uh, we'll call it baptism. And so it's really interesting to see how they translate the word baptizo in the Bible when it's not talking about baptism. In Matthew 26, 23 is an example of it. And he answered, he that dippeth, he that baptizo his hand in the dish the same shall betray me. So what does baptism mean? It means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. It is a death, it is a burial, and it is a resurrection in, uh, 
it just exactly like God, uh, like Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.mainstreet-churchofchrist.com. There's a thousand sermons on there. There's all kinds of DVDs and written lessons. You can get a college education on that website. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We have been taught through the Bible the fact that there is but one God. And still today, the Jews pray the Shema three times a day. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Had. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We have learned that the church has a unity of the head. It has a unity of the spirit dwelling within the church, within the saints. God doesn't want to dwell in temples anymore made with hands. He wants to dwell in the hearts of his children in the Holy Spirit. We have a unity of hope or expectation. We look forward to the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. We have a unity of the faith. There's just one faith. Just one faith. New Testament Christianity. Unity of ordinances of baptism for admission into the church. Unity of the Father. Unity of organization of the one body, the church of Christ. Ephesians 4, 7. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. There are special offices and special gifts that Christ gives to each. Ephesians 4 8. Wherefore he said, He that ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. The verse that Paul quotes here is from the Septuagint translation of Psalm 68 18. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also that the Lord God might dwell among them. Thank you, God, for saving me, the rebellious. He ascended on high and gave gifts to men. I hope that you will pick up one of these and have some natural ability and practice what, you, uh, uh, what the New Testament preaches. Paul applies this verse to Christ's ascension to heaven. The captives are sin the curse of the law and death. Gifts are given as a conquering king returning in triumph distributed gifts. Christ gave gifts at his ascension. Verse 9. Now the he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first to the lower parts of earth? That's not talking about the grave. This verse applies to Christ. If he ascended... It shows that he descended before his ascension. Christ is eternal. He descended from heaven to live upon this earth among the most base people, us. He is eternal. He has always been the Word of God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14. This must necessity follow the one ascending is divine. He has a home in heaven, as the psalm that Paul, uh, Paul is quoting indicates. Verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. He descended to the very deepest abasement, taking on human form and becoming a servant. He overcame sin and death with his own death, his burial, and now he is raised. Now he is exalted to the right hand of the throne of God, represented it in heaven, and is above all things. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed to the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast <coughs> to our profession. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's Hebrews 7, 26. Ephesians 4, 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Christ gave gifts in verse 7 through 8. Of these gifts are various offices. In a matter of the offices, some of them continue in existence today. Apostles were all chosen by Christ, and they were eyewitnesses of his death, burial, and resurrection. So there is no more apostles today. Apostles could have no successors. They still re uh, remain as teachers today, and their authority is still supreme and is found in the New Testament. They still teach. Jesus still teaches right now today. Some are prophets. This was an inspired office essential to the church and for teaching until the New Testament was completed. Some, such as Luke and Jude, wrote books of the New Testament. Some evangelists, such as Philip in Acts 8 and 21, Timothy and Titus. This office is to preach the gospel and is necessary as long as the church remains on earth, they will always be evangelists. That's what I am. I'm an evangelist. In 2 Timothy 4.1 is a charge to evangelists. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They'll tell you what you want to hear. God wants you to repent. He doesn't want you to hear what you want to hear. He wants you to hear the hard truth. And it hadn't changed very much, has it, Vernon? You were baptized in 1979. Yeah, it hadn't changed at all. In the Dallas County Jail, you were baptized. Old County Jail. <laughs> the sheriff gave me Jack Ruby's cell for my office and where I'd feel at home. And, uh, <laughs> he was a character. Yeah. And you were there for it too, wasn't you, Vern? <laughs> Evangelists are ministers who do not personally bear fruit for the Lord are taking up pulpit space and salary and living quarters that a soul-winning preacher could take uh, by preaching the gospel. Preachers like that need to be replaced or retrained immediately. In schools, at colleges, and universities, all over the United States today, there are Church of Christ colleges that there are professors who've never led anybody to Christ. What do they know about leading somebody to Christ? How can they teach a preacher? How can they make preachers out of people when they've not ever done it their own self? Before I came to this church, Sister Perkins, who was a widow of one of our elders, told me, she said, you know, Kelly, why you're perfect for this church? And I said, why? This is 23 years ago. She said, because you have well prepared yourself. Before I came here, I had taught and baptized over 5,000 people. I know something about it. What does a guy know about it that's never taught anybody? But that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Pastors and teachers are also known as shepherds and bishops and elders and presbyters and overseers. They are described as especially those that labor in the word and doctrine. They must be not novices in the faith. They must be sound in the faith. They must be people who visit. They must be people who do the work of a shepherd, that do the work of an elder. Verse 12, 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, helping saints to higher and holier lives by carrying out the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4.13 Till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. Unity is one of the great objects to be attained through these offices. Not only unity of the faith, but notice the verse, unity of knowledge of the Son of God. Full unity will be found only when we all know Christ alike. A full-grown man is noble manhood, fully developed to being Christ-like. What was Christ like? He was just exactly like God. What are we to be as men today? We're to become Christ-like. What are you to become as women today? You're to become Christ-like. In all holiness. Verse 14. That we henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and the slide of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He gives the idea here of a sailing ship that's lost its sails and it's turned sideways to the wind. And the storm is carrying the ship and it's just taking it wherever the storm goes. Don't be tossed to and fro by every kind of twiddly DD that's got some sort of doctrine that he wants to teach. They tell you all the time, oh, I'm an apostle, I'm an apostle so-and-so. And I've got a secret revelation. The Lord told me he's coming back by December. And they've got every kind of thing. They've, they've said every kind of day. In 1840, a guy named, uh, it was called a great disappointment. A guy, I can't remember his name. I'm having a brain lock. Darby. He decided, well, the Lord's going to return in 1844. Sell everything you've got and give it to me. The Lord's returning in 1844. And he's coming back on the Day of Atonement in 1844. Just keep bringing that money on in here. And so, <clears throat> sure enough, the Lord didn't return on the Day of Atonement in 1844. They all took a sack lunch, wore white robes, went up the mountaintop, waited for the Lord to come back 1844. He didn't show up. He said, hold it, hold it. I, got to, I missed it by one year. He said, keep bringing that money. Keep bringing that money on in here. And, and so out of that came... The Pentecostal Church, the Seventh Day Adventists, and the Jehovah Witnesses. Will you ever stop being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and slide of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive? Will you ever stop be doing that? Children are feeble, inexperienced, and easily deceived. Acts 20, verse 30. Paul told even the elders at Ephesus. And of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Notice that they drew away disciples and made followers of Kelly instead of making followers of Christ. That's something you can't accuse me of. You follow Jesus, you don't follow me. Anytime that I step aside from this word, you follow him. Ephesians 4, 15, But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him all things which is ahead, even Christ. His truth is never to give place to false doctrine. Be spoken only in love. Tempered with meekness. Ephesians 4, 16, From whom the whole body fitteth, joined together, and compacted, that which uh, every joint supplies, according to the effectual workings of the measure of every part, making increase of the body to edifying itself in love. Every member of the body is reviving life from the head. You can cut the hand off a body, and the body will still live. But if you cut the head off, the body is dead. Christ is the head. 
If we don't follow Christ, we're a headless horseman around here. We're not ever, we're not ever going to be alive. We're going to be dead forever dead. Paul returns to his exhortation found in verses 1 and 2, which is holiness. Having their understanding darkened, verse 18, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. The Gentiles walked in the darkness of life. Vanity and life is, is darkness. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, having trampled conscience underfoot until it is callous, and having silenced its admonition, they gave themselves over to lasciviousness, which is Greek, angela, filthy wantonness and evil. Purity of life was not even considered a virtue among the Gentiles. You need to figure out how to be holy in this X-rated world that we live in today. You understand? We live in an X-rated world. You can't turn the TV on that you don't see Hollywood trying to take you to hell. You can't listen to a song that you don't hear wickedness in the worldly music that is today. You can't watch a movie or a show that there isn't something that's wrong and twisting your mind, making you think that wrong is right and right is wrong. Verse 20, But you have not so learned Christ. You are Gentiles like those described, but you uh, have learned Christ, in other words. If it so be that you heard of him, been taught of him as the truth in Jesus. Verse 22. That you may put off concerning the former conversation of the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. How do you do that? Romans 12. 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The scripture is the only thing that can do that. Verse 24, and that you may put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You have a new mind within yourself. Verse 25, therefore putting away lying and speak every man the truth with his neighbor for we are members one of another. 26, be ye angry and sin not and let not the sun go down on your wrath. This is a quote from Psalms 4.4 in the Septuagint version. Do not sin through anger. If circumstances of anger arise, do not be led astray. Neither give place to the devil. Verse 27. Let him who stole steal no more, but let him labor with his hands, proving those things that are good that he may have to give to those that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed by the day of redemption. If we grieve the Spirit away, we will not be sealed on the day of redemption. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Isn't that the truth? Christ took on human form. He lived the perfect sinless life and died on the cross for you and I. He was buried and He arose again the third day and that's the Gospel. If you believe the Gospel, there's no reason whatsoever for you to be lost. You can march right down to front here and make confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can repent of your sins. You can confess Christ as Lord and be baptized into Christ. If you have sin in your life, you need the help of the church and the prayers of the church. Won't you come now while we stand and sing?